Good to see you here this morning. You know, it's a special uh, morning we've had. We haven't done uh, parent dedication and, and first or sixth grade Bibles on a Sunday morning before. Um, typically on Sunday night, mostly families present. But we just felt like it was important to involve our whole body in this service. The, the parents that you saw earlier who have uh, dedicated themselves this morning, the children that they're raising, those folks are a significant influence on this church, uh, on our culture, and on our future. You know, it's very cliche to say, talking about children, that they are our future, but that is a true statement. They are the future leaders, and they are the ones who will be making some very significant decisions when those of us who are adults in this room are quite a bit older. And so we need to think seriously about what that means uh, for us. And I think it was important this morning for the whole body to see these sixth graders receiving Bibles. Uh, we're a church that believes and stands on and speaks forth to our culture that we believe in the infallibility of the Word of God. We believe that as Christ's followers, we're supposed to uh, know and obey this book, and we believe our life depends on this book. Those words that I shared earlier from Joshua 1.8, that if we're going to be prosperous and successful, not in the sense that the world views prosperity and, and success, but if we're going to be prosperous and successful spiritually, it will be because we have spent time reading and, and meditating and reflecting and memorizing and building these words into our hearts and into our lives. So our children need to see us, not just the infants this morning as they grow, but those sixth graders. They need to see all of the body, uh, all of us who are part of the family of faith, affirming God's word for every one of us. And I, I want to say how thankful I am for our uh, children's ministry, for Brad, uh, for Merrill, for Mandy, for a ministry that equips parents to teach the scriptures. They spend a lot of time doing that. They do what they can to equip parents to give godly biblical counsel in raising their children, and uh, they impress upon boys and girls through all those years the importance of God's word, and, and they book in that with in the first grade and then again in the sixth grade, giving those children an age-appropriate uh, copy of Scripture that they can understand. It's so important that we not uh, neglect the Word of God. If we neglect the Word of God, we're not a true church. If we neglect the Word of God, we're not Christ's followers. If we neglect the Word of God, we really have nothing to offer this world. There's, there's nothing different about us. So this morning, as we think about challenging these, these parents, as I said earlier, it was a parent dedication, not, not a baby dedication. As we think about challenging those parents, as we think about challenging those sixth graders to continue on, it's also about reminding and challenging our entire community as a church body. All of us need to understand we're in this together when it comes to raising the next generation spiritually. We, we all have a stake. We all have an interest in that. We want to see these infants and children grow to honor and to love the Lord, and it's important to our entire body. You know, I was thinking this week of the most common terms that are used to talk about the church. You know well that the church is not a building. The church is people. And one of the most common terms, in fact, you'll see it most often in Scripture. Paul used it a lot. One of the most common terms to talk about the church is to talk about the church as the body. It is the body of Christ. And in saying that, Paul was very simply trying to communicate to us that we belong together. That, that we work most effectively together, that the church functions as God intended. The church is healthy when we recognize that every one of us is important and, and we belong to each other. Here's another common term besides the body. Maybe you have even used this one. Perhaps you were uh, out somewhere and, and you ran into a friend and then a, another friend who is a church member here with you and you might have introduced this church member to your new friend or to your other friend by saying, yes, this is Jim, he's part of my church family. And I think family is another uh, great descriptor, a great definition of the church. And what I love about Geyer Springs is I think we really get it when it comes to the fact we're family. We look out for each other. We, we take care of each other. It's very rare that I make it to a family's home in a time of need or a time of crisis. It's very rare that I get there and don't find out that someone else within the body, their small group leader or some other connection they have, someone else within the body has not already been there and, and contacted that, that person as part of their family and, and sought to take care of the need. All right, I don't want to belabor the point about being family this morning, but here's what I'm trying to say this morning to all of us as a church body. Clearly what I'm going to say applies to parents, but for those of us here whose kids maybe are already grown, 
Those of us here maybe who uh, don't have kids in, in the area, they've grown, they, they've moved off, the grandkids aren't close by. Those of us here who don't have children, who may be single, regardless of your age, regardless of your stage, regardless of your condition in life, as a member of this family, you have a responsibility to every member of the family, including the parents and, and the children that we recognize this morning. I want to look at a passage in the Old Testament this morning. Anytime you study scripture, you should ask, well, to whom was this addressed? The text we're going to look at this morning was addressed to the children of Israel, uh, to God's people, to the nation of Israel. It's going to refer to the spiritual upbringing of children, but I want you to understand this address was to the entire community. Now, you know, when you read about the Israelites in the Old Testament, you can clearly see the importance of community and how each individual had an impact on the whole. For example, in Joshua chapter 6, when the nation of Israel conquered Jericho, it wasn't just the fighting men who were sent out. It wasn't just the fighting men and the priests and those who carried the ark that were sent out. The entire community was a part of that seven-day process of conquering Jericho. Everyone Every man, woman, boy, and girl, from the youngest to the oldest, took part in and cooperated in that victory. But you also see the impact of disobedience in the community in the very next chapter. When the people were told, when they conquered Jericho, everything in the city was dedicated to the Lord, meaning it was either to be destroyed or put in his treasury. And Achan saw some things that he wanted, and he took them. He basically stole from the Lord and hid those things. And when God revealed that it was Achan, not only was Achan and his entire family stoned and destroyed by fire, but prior to that happening, the reason they knew that there was disobedient sin in the community was they went up after Jericho against a small city, Ai, that they should have easily routed, and they were completely routed by the citizens of Ai. So the community is affected by the whole for good or for bad. And, and for us as a church community, we can be affected positively or negatively based on the obedience of those in our community. So we want to we wanna challenge and we want to encourage and we want to insist each other in being Christ followers. And what I'm saying to you this morning is we want to all be a part of making a significant impact in the lives of these children. It's the African proverb you've heard before, it takes a village to raise a child. That is certainly true. Um, that village should not be the government. That village should not be the school system. That village should be. There's no better village than the church. Deuteronomy chapter 6 this morning. If you'll turn there, it should be pretty easy to find. Fifth book in the Old Testament. And if you have spent much time with me, you know this is my favorite passage when it comes to speaking about the raising of children. Let me give you a little background very quickly. If you're not familiar with the story, Deuteronomy 6, um, after... The exodus from Egypt, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the children of Israel are now finally about to go into the promised land. Moses, although he's not going to enter the promised land, Moses is still the leader, and so he is explaining to them and teaching them uh, the, the things of God. And if you look back in chapter 5, probably right across the page from chapter 6 in your Bible, he's reminding them of a covenant that God made with them at Horeb when they were given the Ten Commandments. And so you see the Ten Commandments listed there just as they were in Exodus 20. But they've also been given other very specific instructions and laws regarding how they are to live when they enter the land. Now, I want you to picture this in your mind because we're going to be talking about instruction given to raising children. But what you picture in your mind, again, it's the entire community. It's the entire nation. Yes, these commands are being given to parents, and specifically if you're a dad here today, to fathers, because they have the primary responsibility of raising their children in the Lord. But the entire assembly is gathered. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every one of every generation is gathered to hear from the Lord through Moses. Let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 4, hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him alone you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Now, we're going to drill down in just a moment at verses 4 through 9, because that's really the heart uh, of the passage. But before we do, I want you to look with me at the warning in verses 10 through 15. The reason he's reminding them, they, they've been told and told and told these commands. They probably know them, at least the, the Ten Commandments by heart at this point. The reason he's reminding them of the importance of following God's commands is because of the tendency that we have, not just them, but also us, the tendency we have to forget God when we're in a place of prosperity. In Proverbs chapter 30, you, you may think Proverbs were all written by Solomon, not all of them. The 30th chapter was written by a guy named Agur ben Jacob. He collected these Proverbs. Listen to what he wrote in Proverbs 38 and 9. It's a prayer to the Lord. Give me neither poverty nor riches, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane your name. What was Agur asking God to do? He said, God, let me just kind of live a medium life. If I'm poor, I might steal to feed my family. And that would bring dishonor. That would profane your name. But God, if I'm rich, I might in my riches forget you and say who is the Lord that's the same concept here that we're looking at Deuteronomy down in verse 12 what does he say to them look what's going to happen is when you eat and are full you need to take care lest you forget the Lord verses 10 and 11 back it up here why because it's God who's given you great and, and, and mighty cities that you didn't build you didn't build these cities when you walked into the promised land these cities were built you're going to get houses full of good things you didn't acquire on your own. You didn't dig the wells. You didn't dig the cisterns. You didn't plant the vineyards, the olive trees. You're going to have all this prosperity, verse 12, when you eat and are full, take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And if you've ever read any of the Old Testament, you know the story. That's exactly what happened again and again and again. God blessed and blessed and blessed his people, but they continually forgot and brought judgment on themselves. Now, I don't know if this occurs to you when you read that part of the passage, but I think it's a picture of our nation and specifically of the church in the West, of the church in America. We have experienced blessing on top of blessing. And in the midst of our blessings, we forget God. We, we don't seek God as we once did. We don't serve him with all of our heart. The gods of this world continually are turning our attention away from him. And so we've got to refocus and, and, and we've got to, for ourselves and the generations who follow, do exactly what the Israelites were warned about, not ignore the giver because you're so focused on the gift. He's the blesser. It's not about the blessing. It's about the one who blesses. And they continually forgot that. And so they're warned. When you get to a place of prosperity, when you get to a place that all your needs are met, when you get to a place that you feel like you've got life by the tail, you've got it all handled, you better be careful lest you forget the Lord your God. Now, verse 4 and following. Here's, so here's the instruction that's given them. If the, if the community is going to stay on course, if they're going to stay on the path, if they're going to walk with God and honor him and be obedient, here's how it's going to happen. And again... These verses are addressed to the entire community. Verse 4 through 9 is the um, Jewish confession of faith. It's called a Shema. 
and they would recite this or they would repeat this at least twice daily. And the fundamental concept of their confession or creed was what you see in verse 4, there is only one God. There can't be more than one supreme, there can't be more than one absolute, there can't be more than one perfect almighty being, only one. We live in a culture that says there are many gods or there are many ways to God. No, Scripture teaches there is one God and there is one way to the one true God. There is one God. And verse 5 says, look, this is a response. If you understand, you believe there's only one God, then, then how do we respond to him? And, and Jesus quoted this very verse. You've seen this verse in the New Testament. He quoted this very verse when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And it's what you see in verse 5. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's it. In fact, you can sum up all ten of the Ten Commandments in the greatest commandment, which Jesus said was love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and the second commandment, which is like unto it, love your neighbors yourself. That's the Ten Commandments right there. If you look at the Ten Commandments, they're broken down in those two categories. So here, Moses is reminding them, you've got to love God with your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. If you're doing that, you don't have to worry about anything else because he's a priority of your heart. If you're loving God with all your heart and soul and might, that means you've surrendered your will to him and you're walking with him daily. And if that's what you're doing, you'll never have to wonder if you're living a life that pleases God. Look at verse 6. How do, you, how do you love God in this way? How do you get to that point? These words, he says in verse 6, God's words are to be on your heart. Now, what, is, what does that mean that God's word are to be on, words are to be on your heart? Well, in the Hebrew... You have to understand that the word that we translate heart in the Hebrew, it didn't refer so much to the emotions, but to the intellect. So when he says these words will be in your heart, what he's saying is these words are to be continually on your mind. Not just on Sunday, not just when you go to Bible study, not just when you get up in the morning and read the scripture for five minutes and call it good. Listen, let me, let me pause here and say this. If you're a brand new believer and you've not gotten the habit of reading God's word and praying, you should start your day just five minutes, just ten minutes, reading and praying the word of, reading the word of God and praying. But listen to me. Most in this room are not new believers. If you're a believer and you've been walking with God for some time and you've grown in your faith, if you think five minutes in Scripture in the morning is enough to protect you from the wiles of Satan, you're out of your spiritual mind. You hear me? That's not going to do it. Not in the world that you and I live in, but he's saying these words are to continually be on your mind. You should be constantly, consciously reflecting on the word of God. And I'll say this as well. You can't just get up in the morning and read a couple of verses and necessarily consciously, constantly reflect on the word of God. It requires some work and some effort like in memorizing scripture. Like in knowing that the Bible says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night. You've got to be reflecting on and thinking on Scripture in that way. And, and if these words, and, and it takes time and effort, okay? It takes time and effort. You have to read and you have to reread and you have to say, well, what does that mean? And you have to reflect on it. You have to meditate. You have to ask yourself, what is, what is God saying to me and, and to my heart and to my life? If these words are constantly on your heart, then they're constantly flowing from you. You're, you're thinking his words. You're, you're speaking his words. These words are directing the course of your life. You get in a conversation with somebody about whatever topic, and the Holy Spirit of God will bring to your mind what you studied from his word. Do you know he's promised he would do that? In John 14, 26, when the disciples were all bummed out that Jesus was about to leave them, he said, listen, I'm sending you a helper. And in John 14, 26, he said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things, listen, and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. You don't have to worry about decisions you may face, even difficult decisions down the road, if you're daily spending time reflecting and meditating and building God's word in your heart and your life. When the time comes, he's going to give you what you need. Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart. And remember, in, in the Hebrew, that's the will or the, the intellect. 
Be careful what you're thinking and reflecting on. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. That's why the Word of God is so important. That's why you have to build the Word of God into your life so that it flows from your life and you live in a way that pleases and honors God. Now, verse 7, that's what I really wanted to get to and emphasize today is we're thinking today about the children that God has blessed our church family with. Look at verse 7. Is this a word to the parents of these children? Absolutely. If you're a parent, this is your first and foremost responsibility. But again, remember, the whole community is hearing this instruction. I think if you're speaking to an entire community of people and you say your children or our children, there's a sense of responsibility expressed with that for the whole community. Let's say that we're sitting here this morning and I asked uh, Mandy and and Brad and Meryl, I want you to bring all the children, preschool all the way to sixth grade, bring them in, and we brought them all in here and lined them up across the front of this stage. And I said to us as a church family, these are our children. Now, are are they our children by blood? No, not unless we're the parents. We didn't bear them. But when I say these are our children, I'm saying... These are part of our community. These are part of our family of faith. And if these are our children, we have a responsibility, all of us, not just their parents, to care for them. Okay, that's the background. Look at verse 7. After he tells us that his words are to be on our hearts, then he says, teach them diligently. What does that mean? It means to repeat, to continually speak these words before them until their lives are imprinted with the word of God. Look look what he says. Teach them diligently. Look at this, four times. When you're at home, when you're away from home, when you're going to bed at night, when you're getting up in the morning. What's he saying? Every opportunity all through the day, we are to talk about God's word constantly. Now, yes, that first goes to the parents, but many of us are around children that are not our children, but are part of our community, part of our body, part of our family of faith, and we have the opportunity to speak the word of God into them as well. And I'll tell you this, parents, listen to me. It gets even more vital the older your children get. You better start when they're young and get in the habit because as they get older, it's much more vital. Why? Because they're exposed to so much of the impurity and ungodliness of this world. Let's say that I held up a, a glass this morning, an empty glass, and I said, hey, I, I got a problem I need, I need you guys to help me with. This glass is full of air. I need to get the air out of this glass, but I don't have a vacuum pump. How can I get the air out of this glass? Anyone know? What can I do to get the air out? Fill it with what? Fill it with water. As I pour the water into the glass, the air has to evacuate. That's why it's so important that we're building God's word into our children, especially as they get older and they're exposed to more and more of the evil of this world. We pour the word of God in to get the impurities out. What's he saying here in verse 7? In every waking moment, we're to teach God's principles to our children by our words and by our actions. And again, that's for parents, but it's also for the community. I learn some pretty poor behavior as a young man on the church campus, and I'm sorry for you guys that have this role for what I'm about to say, from some deacons. I learned some things that were ungodly from some deacons while I was at church. Our deacons are not that way, okay? I assure you, they're not. But all of us have to be by our words and actions, helping parents pour the word of God and the things of God into their children. I'm going to wrap up just a second here. Look at verses 8 and 9. This may sound kind of weird to you. He says, you shall bind them, talking about his words, as a sign on your hand, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The the bind them on your hand or between your eyes, that was called a phylactery, and it was a little leather box, not very big, and it had laces where they would put the box here on the hand and lace it all the way around the arm, all the way up. Or they would put that little leather box right between their eyes, kind of where you can see it, even though it's not blocking your vision, and and tie the lace around their head. What was that about? That was about continually having Scripture before them. Anytime they went to do something, to work with their hands, they were reminded about the Word of God and the importance of making sure that everything they did was in obedience to His Word. It was constantly on their minds, literally, 
in that box. And then the, the doorpost of the house and the gates, there was a little box called a mezuzah, a little wooden box. And in that box, oh, I didn't say this in the phylactery, same thing in the phylactery in this box, there'd be a little bitty scroll rolled up, and on that scroll was the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love him with all your heart, your mind, your strength. Continually be reminded, continually keep before them, keep God's word constantly before them. And I would say when the children of our church family are around any of us, they should constantly be reminded of the word of God and the things of God. Now, you're here this morning. You're not a parent of a child that is part of our church family. Again, your kids are grown, your kids are gone. You didn't have kids, you're single, whatever. If that's you, what do we need to do as a community? Well, obviously we can pray. Not just for those we introduced this morning. There may be a family in, in our church that you know that you could pray for. And when you pray, that would mean that you have some contact with them. That you call them up. Hey, Will, let's think about your kids this week. Is there anything specific that I could pray? Anything that you and Courtney feel like you need in raising these children to honor and love and serve the Lord? You, you can speak, not just to the parents, not just words of encouragement to the parents, but you can speak the word into the lives of those children. If you know a family that has children well enough, there's no reason you wouldn't speak about the things of God to those children, is there? And most importantly, you can certainly live as an example. I would hate for any children that are part of our church family, whether it's on this campus or off this campus, to see any of us adults who claim to be Christ followers walking with God doing something that would cause them to question the validity of the faith. We can live as examples. You got several materials when you came in this morning. We've already talked about a couple of them. Let me mention this, this last one, this booklet. Brad and I were in a conversation sometime back talking about catechism. By the way, catechism is not a Catholic word, okay? Sometimes people get freaked out when we do new stuff. I remember the first year we did an Advent celebration here. People are like, are we, are we starting to do Catholic church stuff? No. Catechism, the word catechism simply refers to a form of teaching, which is question and answer. Most catechisms are about 165 questions, and they're quite lengthy. So Brad wrote down a 30-question catechism. You'll see there's a question, there's an answer, and then there's the scripture. Listen, this is a great tool for parents and grandparents to begin to teach their children the things of God. It's very simple. It's very repetitive. You ask the question, they give the answer. You look at the scripture together. Hopefully you learn the scripture as well as the question and answer. And you just keep adding to it. And you go back and you go back to question one. And then you do two. And then you do three. And then you review one and two. It's a very simple way. But let me say this to those of us who do not have children here. If you have grandchildren, even if they live somewhere else, we are, uh, Luann has already contacted our daughter, Sarah, our son, Jordan, and said, hey, we're going to get you a copy of the catechism so that anytime we're around your kids or anytime we're FaceTiming or whatever, we can participate with them. Why is that important? Because they need to see that not just their parents, but other significant adults in their life are concerned with building the word of God into them. If you don't have children here, but you've got a, some, some family friends that have children, you might ask them, hey, can you kind of, Will, can you keep me up to speed on where y'all are in your catechisms? Because I might, next time I see one of your kids, ask question number 10. If y'all are on 12, I, I might ask them. But serving together as the community, as the body, as the family of faith, all of us investing into these children because that strengthens all of us and allow God's, allows God to work in us and through us.